Hey, Amster, remember that early episode where we didn't even review a game? Ugh, that ranking Pokemon games episode? That was just an excuse to talk about a bunch of games at once. So how come it's a numbered episode of playing with myself when all the Pokemon opinion episodes don't count? Give me a break, it was episode six. I was only beginning to figure out the series myself. It didn't even number the Smash Dun 30 episode. I love that one. Numbering that stupid rankings episode has become my biggest regret of this entire series. Stop rubbing it in. Now I say we call out how dumb that was and yeah. celebrate the stupidity by making another pointlessly numbered non-review episode. Why on earth would I ever agree to- Because it's been precisely 100 episodes since that faithfully mislabeled video, and it's the perfect time to- uh, basically do something totally unrelated to reviewing games again. Like what? You know, you also made a random non-game episode back in your early Ocarina Hero days. I did? And just like you did way back in 2008, we're gonna solve one of the biggest debates in video game history, uncovering the truth about the timeline of The Legend of Zelda. We're gonna what? In a numbered episode. I'm haunted by endless ghosts of my own creation. Well, if we must do this, I actually was once regarded as one of the biggest names online in Zelda timeline theories back in the day. Honestly, it even preceded my reputation as, as the guy who sucks at games and still tries to be funny. Like, why did I ever show you my old channel? Because you don't have any other friends. Anyway, believe it or not, the Zelda timeline was actually a huge debate online as the fan base and the game library grew. Some people even studied the changing landscape of Hyrule or its indigenous races just to determine a chronology. Though very archaeological, that also sounds kind of like overkill for a a puzzle game where a whole lake or mountain range might move for no particular reason. Well, it was mostly rationalizing why races like the Zora would be friendly in one game and then violent in the next, and live in completely different corners of the map. It sounds like it's gonna be way more complicated than it needs to be. Also, there's no way the developers ever intended that. Oh, I assure you, this goes way deeper than it ever should have, all for the sake of solving The Legend of Zelda. Can't people just like their little elf boy games without trying to decipher the Da Vinci Code out of them? My personal theory was founded on following the few constants in this series, the whereabouts and conditions of the Master Sword, Ganon, and Ganondorf. Wait, you're assuming Ganon and Ganondorf aren't the same guy? Basically, yeah, it was the only way to justify how many times the big pig man dies throughout the series. Besides, it's not too much of a stretch to assume that the man was just a conduit for the beast to utilize and vice versa. And that gets us where? Well, a structured timeline that actually worked for one. I found the only logical flow of games that allowed for everything to work and published it beginning and hinging on the time paradox ending in Ocarina of Time. So, after Link defeats Ganon as an adult, it begins one timeline, and after he goes back to warn young Zelda about Ganondorf as a child, it begins another? Yeah, it's a bonkers idea, but it's straight up what the ending strongly implied, so pretty much everybody rolled with it, me included, calling it the split timeline theory. Sounds to me like an excuse for all the nonsense in the series to make sense, because now you can just throw conflicting games on alternate timelines and it'll still work. Yes. Oh, cool, Olympa. However, something big happened in 2011 that dropped a bomb on the whole speculation scene. Let me guess, Nintendo did something stupid. Yes. Alongside the newly released Skyward Sword, Nintendo dropped an art anthology book about the series, with one and only one page dedicated to depicting the first ever publication of an official Zelda timeline. Uh, isn't that a good thing? <laughs> Uh, no. I swear there is no pleasing you people. So from the very beginning, Shigeru Miyamoto had claimed that he, alongside Eiji Aonuma, had a secret document hidden away inside of Nintendo with a canon timeline for their reference alone. whoop the frickin do and they finally published it, so what? Well, for one, it finally proved that he was lying. <sighs> what? Riddle me this. How does one create a canon timeline when the games that currently exist only take place in various nonsensical connections to other games that haven't even been conceived yet. Excuse me? Just hold the thought as I show you this official timeline. Obviously, they're making this whole document to push Skyward Sword as the new beginning of the series, so of course that's where they're gonna start. Next up, they show us Minish Cap and Four Swords, which doesn't actually work considering that's where the Master Sword gets destroyed and reforged into the Pakuri Blade and ultimately the Four Sword, but that continuity mistake is the least of my concerns considering what comes next. But isn't the Link to the Past Link in Four Swords? That game didn't even happen yet. Yeah, I know, it's dumb. Now get a load of this. Ocarina of Time? Yes, with both endings splitting into alternate timelines. Hold on, what's that third line? Wait, what? 
The hero is defeated? <laughs> what a load of bullcrap! Needless to say, this pissed people off. Obviously because there isn't a single reference or minute inclination that failing the game would result in a canonical ending, but I digress. We haven't even hit the worst part yet. I wasn't even invested in all this nonsense and I feel deeply wronged for you. Remember what I said before about Miyamoto's secret document being a lie? Let's take another gander at that timeline. If this timeline truly is the supposed secret document, then pull up your big boy pants and look me dead in the eyes and explain to me why every single Zelda game before Ocarina of Time's release takes place on this third split where the hero is defeated. In what universe does someone intentionally construct a series chronology only to create a new game where the only canonical way to successfully complete the game is to die? It's simple. He's either delusional or he's full of crap. How do you keep enjoying a series when the creators are clearly so catastrophically misinformed and deceptive about their own creation that they would go to these lengths? It's just like they copied everyone else's homework with the whole split timeline thing, but added an amateur twist on it without actually understanding the base theory to begin with for all the sake of appearing unique. It sure didn't help my love for the series that Skyward Sword was the newest game at the time. To hear all about that abomination, check out our massive review shameless plug. So, the supposed secret timeline was a sham to tease fans, and the released official one was just haphazardly thrown together to help sell an expensive art book? Yes! <laughs> well, I guess that's the end of that. Oh, no, it's not! But how is that not the end? For most people, it is. But, oh, oh no, I'm just getting started! Let's say you're content sucking Miyamoto and Aonuma's farts, and totally accept that the official timeline is correct, regardless of how impossibly boneheaded it is. Idiot. Therefore, you're left with one very difficult pill to swallow. If you accept the idea that Link failing to complete his quest in Ocarina of Time can indeed result in a canon ending to the game, regardless of there not being a the end message instead of a game over, do you even know how stories work? Then you also must accept that any new game can and probably will do the same at any point and without warning. Oh Jesus, you mean yes! Link gets married to a fish and gives up adventuring to be a stay-home dad for his tadpoles? New timeline! Link opens a chest with a gold rupee inside and exploits the bank to pursue a career of financial fraud through time travel. New timeline. Link dresses up like a cow in hopes that Milan will try to milk him, but instead he gets turned into burgers. New timeline. At any point, any choice contrary to the plot results in a new timeline, creating a kaleidoscopic effect of fractals diverging away from a single coherent timeline and into chaotic infinity. Link gets arrested for breaking and entering. New timeline. Link spends his fortune fruitlessly fishing in a pond the size of a bathtub. New timeline. Link wanders the wilderness catching butterflies for a little girl. New timeline. Link goes to college for sociology only to drop out because he can't speak. New timeline. And eventually complete nonsense. Link opens a duck-powered flying taxi service and revolutionizes economic travel. New timeline! Link dies of blue potion dysentery. New timeline! Link develops a gambling addiction and spirals into inescapable debt. New timeline! Link wallows in guilt after causing a local town to die of dehydration due to having all their pottery destroyed. New timeline! Don't like this option? Well, then all you're left with is what I like to call... Look, it's obvious they lied. There never was a sensible canon timeline to The Legend of Zelda, and there never will be. It was one thing when there were only like seven games, some of which were easy, direct sequels of each other, but now the series is such an incomprehensible disaster. Nowadays, two games might have absolutely nothing to do with each other, but offhandedly reference each other in tiny pointless ways that just throw off the whole thing. I remember my original timeline theory completely falling apart just because of the postman existing in games where he shouldn't. Think about that. My entire theory was dismantled due to the existence of a mailman. Isn't it crazy how Nintendo single-handedly destroyed an entire popular fan base of speculators just by giving them exactly what they asked for? We asked for it under the assumption that there really was a timeline and weren't being fed lies. How are we supposed to know we were opening a Pandora's box conspiracy theory? So what you're saying is there is no timeline. I'm saying that there is no coherent arrangement of Zelda games in a chronology that actually accounts for everything every little thing, because they were never created with that in mind. So you're saying your options in living in a post-Hyrule Historia world are embracing absolute chaos or living in blissful ignorance? There is no in-between, no gray area. It is all or nothing, infinity over zero. This is the definition of looking too far into something. The Legend of Zelda was never intended to have a singular chronology. 
fans just wanted it and created this problem for themselves. The games, however, are all intended to be a word-of-mouth retelling of an ancient story altered throughout history. And that's why they're all so similar, but also different and impossible to link. No pun intended. That pun was most certainly intended. And with that in mind, may I finally present to you THE Legend of Zelda. Long ago, or possibly in the future, in a distant land named Hyrule. Well, most of the time it's Hyrule, but every now and again... This is off to a great start. Okay, a land of an indeterminate name, generally referred to as Hyrule, was once populated by many races throughout time, such as the mountain rock folk, the Gorons, and the aquatic merfolk, the Zoras, who would eventually evolve into the avian bird race, the Rito, when the waters rose, flooding the land. That makes absolutely no sense, but I'm getting ahead of myself. One race in particular was elf-like. No, well, uh, ba basically regular humans, but with elf ears. I'm on the edge of my seat, Grandpa known as Hylians, whose royal family ruled Hyrule. A little on the nose, but okay. Now, there may or may not have been a king, but there certainly wasn't a queen. However, with absolute certainty, I can say that there was a princess, and her name was Zelda. At least you're finally sure about something. Or at least she's a princess most of the time. She could also be a pirate or a random girl. Oh, come on! The anywho's, the Hylian Knights defended the royal family of disputable size and rank from the legions of monsters encroaching upon their kingdom from various uh, points of origin. This isn't vague at all. And these beasts were kept at bay from the lands of Hyrule until the appearance of one malicious entity whose appearance and name are up for debate. A what? You're giving me nothing here. This evil character may or may not have been a giant boar. Huh? A floating spiky eyeball thing. Yeah. Or a dark-skinned man of the desert. Whoa! Regardless of his name, he appeared suddenly and did some d disagreeable thing that caused problems. This is the most exciting story ever told. Historians argue about the particulars, so let's carry on. As the kingdom faced some sort of dangerous plight, either impending or long past. Actually, does this even count as a story? A hero rose up from the dwindling ranks of the Hylians, possibly a knight, uh, a ranch hand, islander, shunned orphan, fairy boy of the woods, or something along those lines, sure. And his name... Yes? It escapes me. I think you're the one who gets to give him a name most of the time. What does that even mean? I thought this was a story. Okay, well, every now and then he's referred to as Link. So let's go on with that. I wanted to name him Keith Aroni. So Link, or in some universes also known as Keith Aroni, traveled across the land of probably Hyrule on a quest. To what? To, um, collect three things, usually green, red, and blue, and generally in that order, found hidden in dungeons that weren't necessarily prisons like dungeons, more like the traditional D&D dungeons in name alone. Oh, this is getting good. Where the indiscriminate hero guy would solve puzzles like pushing blocks and lighting lamps. Those aren't puzzles. So he could eventually find the dungeon boss, who wasn't necessarily in command or anything. He was just a really, really big enemy who the vast majority of the time was only vulnerable to the one tool found in the same dungeon. Gotta say, that's pretty dumb. Anyway, Keith Aroni defeats the monsters and collects collects the colored things and gets a sword most of the time, usually. No kidding. Oh yeah, but not just any sword. A sword that is said to really hurt whichever bad guy we are currently subscribing to. Remind me to never listen to your stories ever again. So after collecting some more things of some similar size, description, and or origin, hidden away in equally elaborate means across the land, sky or see, Keith Aroni confronts the bad thing and rescues the possibly Princess Zelda and defeats the generally evil character, the end. <laughs> Wait, that's it? Oh, right. And this event takes place over and over again continuously throughout history as these three characters are reincarnated perpetually for all of time. Wait, really? I think. Come on! Also, Keith Aroni generally likes the color green, but he's also dabbling in a little cyan lately. No, no, you're done. Not much of a legend anymore if it's so mangled and disjointed. There's nothing at its increasingly vague core anymore. Keith Aroni's also generally left-handed but has proven himself to occasionally be ambidextrous. The legend, Fable of Zelda is a mess. The story is a sham and the timeline is a joke. Either you're in on the joke or the joke's on you. Cause if you're still buying into this baloney, then you're just playing with yourself.
<laughs> so, which is it for you, infinity or zero? Thanks for watching, and remember to like and subscribe for more, and use the links in the description to nominate your own episode. And thank you to all of our Patreon members, Aspen, Arrow, Sid, and Genio. Boop!